Hello, everyone. My name is Paul. Thank you for coming back to this session after uh, a good lunch. Um, so yeah, welcome to this, the day of EDGE, um, Model Serving at the EDGE Made Easier is the name of my talk. I am Paul Van Eck. I am an open source engineer, uh, software engineer at IBM based in Silicon Valley Labs at, in California. Um, my co-speaker could not be here today, my co-speaker Animesh Singh. Um, so it'll just be me, but he will be uh, with us in spirit, or more likely probably asleep in, in California. So just to kind of give an outline for the talk, we're going to first kind of go over edge computing, then the whole model serving overview, then the whole notion of using Kubernetes uh, for model serving at the edge, right? Then using model mesh, something called model mesh, which I will introduce to easily manage kind of higher density uh, edge model deployments uh, on Kubernetes on edge. So yeah, we'll go into an example deployment and some challenges that were encountered and some lessons learned. So yeah, so as you all probably already know, we are in the midst of a new generation of computing, you know, edge computing, that's why we're here. And so with each generation of computing uh, before it, edge will impact every industry um, and force you know, IT departments to adapt to new architectures, um, new deployment models, and business models. And so here we focus on bringing computing to offices, dist distribution centers, manufacturing sites. And so this kind of create this decentralized uh, approach to application design and bring with it new challenges of workload management across you know, thousands or millions of edge nodes. And so it helps to visualize edge computing through the continuum of uh, physical infrastructure from centralized data centers to uh, devices, right? So to the far right of the diagram, um, that shows the centralized uh, data centers um, representing you know, cloud-based compute. And you know, here, cloud resources are practically unlimited, where, whereas device resources are inherently constrained. And so, so moving along the continuum from centralized data centers towards devices, the first main edge tier is the um, service provider edge, and this is um, distributed and brings edge computing resources, uh, resources much closer to end users. And so moving even more right, we have the user edge, which represents you know, a highly diverse mixture of, you know, of resources. And you know, as a general rule, the more uh, uh, the closer that edge compute resources get to the physical world, um, you know, the more constrained and specialized uh, they become. So this user edge space is essentially the focus um, uh, for today. And so as we look at, at workloads that benefit from running at the edge, um, we see things like business logic applications, network modernization. Uh, then the focus where I want to kind of focus on today is the notion of stretching AI um, and analytics to the edge. So in this scenario, a user's predefined train models uh, can then be deployed to the edge. Um, additionally, customers can train the models on the edge as well um, in real time by capturing the data and letting the models to, er, and having the models be retrained as they operate at the edge. And so as we look at the machine learning lifecycle, we see that ML models are con constantly being updated. You know, you do your training, your retraining, and deployment. And so model deployment is a very key aspect, um, as without deployment, how else will you consume the model and you know, bring AI to your systems? And so as it turns out, actually doing production grade uh, model deployment and inference is actually you know, plagued with complexities. Um, there are quite a number of things to consider, and you know, here are some of the questions that a user might have to navigate um, when considering model serving approaches. So, but again, the focus for today is model serving at the edge on you know, resource constrained devices, you know, single board computers or, and systems on modules. Um, sometimes you know, it's a necessity to use uh, on-premise and dis distributed um, compute resources that are closer to end users. Um, so user edge deployment in this sense comes with like many benefits. Um, data locality is the first one. You know, we perform inference where the data is um, the, you know, this ties in the quicker inference response times and uh, bandwidth consumption savings. Um, so you no longer have to 
necessarily send your data or your, you know, your inference payload to the cloud or across some expansive network. Um, so, and this also has the benefits of increased security and, you know, data privacy. So, remember, we still have those complexities we want to tackle, those complexities we saw on the, on the, on the previous slide. So, how do we handle these complexities at the edge? And so, one of the ways is, of course, Kubernetes at the edge, and that's kind of the <laughs> topic for today. So, so we want to leverage the orchestration capabilities of Kubernetes at the edge, okay? So as you all may know, there are several ways to use Kubernetes at the edge. Um, you can deploy a whole lightweight cluster on the edge devices um, using things like uh, K3S, micro K8s, and, and something called MicroShift, uh, which is kind of a relatively new project that you know, offers a small form factor uh, OpenShift designed for field deployed, um, low resource devices. And so multiple edge clusters can be deployed um, and you can use something like uh, cluster management tools such as open cluster management to manage each individual cluster. <laughs> and then there's the option of uh, having the control plane on some cloud somewhere and uh, this will be your main Kubernetes cluster, and then you add edge nodes um, managed by something like KubeEdge. Um, and so these edge worker nodes will be available for um, deployment. And so, so for us, um, I'm going to go with the edge deployed Kubernetes clusters to keep everything at the edge. And, you know, I guess one typical approach for uh, deploying apps or models on the edge is to just containerize the model server uh, and create a Kubernetes deployment. And maybe you might mount a volume and, uh, which contains your model files, your assets, and uh, eventually you'll do a kubectl apply and deploy the actual um, containers. So this is essentially what other model serving platforms, you know, what I guess most Kubernetes based uh, model serving platforms inevit inevitably do. Um, however, this can be quite cumbersome, especially when you're dealing with a lot of model frameworks, um, different like TensorFlow and PyTorch each have their own images and different arguments you have to worry about. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a rabbit hole you have to jump in and might be a little daunting. And so you might lose out on certain aspects like the, the feature richness of like scale to zero or um, you might have varying inference request um, formats or protocols that are used on different model servers, which, which can be annoying. So can traditional model serving platforms uh, for Kubernetes extend to edge devices? And so oh, first I'm going to introduce KServe. And so KServe uh, started off in the Kubeflow umbrella as the model serving platform um, for Kubeflow. Um, so it is now a incubating project in the Linux the LF AI and Data Foundation. And so what it is, it's a highly scalable and standards-based model inference platform on Kubernetes for trusted AI. Um, typically, I mean, traditionally, you deploy this on the cloud. Um, you know, you have you, underlying, underlying KServe is Knative and is TO. This is an optional layer. Um, you can either deploy models using Knative or you can use a op uh, raw deployment mode where you just deploy models using uh, just standard uh, Kubernetes resources like deployments, ingresses, and services. So some of the benefits of KServe, it provides an easy to use interface and or CRD called an in inference service for deploying models given a format and uh, storage endpoint. So typically you just need to provide these two items and you can give it to KServe and KServe will know what to do with it. We'll find the appropriate, uh, appropriate images to load um, and, and we'll load it into the container. Uh, another, another, another advantage of KServe is that it revolves around a standardized inference protocol, okay? So this is something that the community has helped shape. Um, people from you know other model servers like Nvidia, I think PyTorch, TorchServe supports this protocol, and Selden's ML server. And so, by implementing this protocol, both inference clients and servers will, or inference clients and servers will increase their kind of their utility and portability. Um, 
you know, can, you can seam seamlessly integrate on other platforms and perform uh, standardized inference using this protocol. So, yeah, so some of the main ones are Triton server, uh, PyTorch Torch serve, and an ML server. And these are some of the standardized uh, REST or gRPC uh, endpoints. So what this case serve brings, um, it's not necessarily good for edge. Um, you know, there's resource overhead because of, you know, sidecars might be injected uh, into each pod, you know. Having an independent model server uh, per, or having an independent model server per model uh, or a model per pod, um, that's kind of, you're really, um, really kind of, it, it's a lot of resource consumption being, uh, being done, okay? It, it, so it doesn't make the best use of, you're already resource constrained on these edge devices and so, we need a way where we need to, where we can serve multiple models in a singular pod or container. And that's where KServe's uh, multi-model serving backend for KServe, um, or for multi-model multi backend um, comes into play. So this is a project that was um, open sourced by IBM last year and has joined the KServe organization. Um, so as users were getting hit with these, these scalability issues with the traditional model serving on Knative, um, we, we decided we needed to open source or consolidate on a, on a, on a path or approach for handle multi-model serving, AKA the having multiple models inside a container. So Model Mesh is a platform, yeah, it's been running inside IBM or in production for quite a few years now and, you know, it's the backbone for quite a few of Watson's services. Um, you have Watson Assistant, Watson Natural Language Understanding, and Watson Discovery. And so Model Mesh allows for, you know, multiple models per container, but it allows models to be paged out if it's not being used um, or loaded just in time if a request comes in that needs that model. So it has some parallels to Knative and serverless, but um, it's kind of just relegated to a single container. So yeah, so it does strike an intelligent trade-off between responsiveness to users and their computational footprint. So I would say it does make the use, uh, makes excellent use of resources um, um, on your cluster. So the overall architecture might look something like this. So when a user applies an infant service YAML um, containing the model details, um, the model mesh controller will select the suitable serving runtime pod in which to host the model. So the pods for these serving runtimes, that's kind of the important part where you see the green and orange. So these pods are, uh, typically they contain three containers. You have your, the model server container, which is typically a third party infant servers or server like Triton or ML server. These support loading multiple models and have unload and loading endpoints, which we can use to kind of dynamically um, alter which models are deployed. And so then we have the model mesh sidecar container, which handles the model management and handles both control and data plane um, request routing. Um, then we have the puller, which handles pulling models from external object stores or uh, endpoints. So this handles pulling it into the actual cluster, pulling model files into the cluster. So a single Kubernetes service at the top points to all pods across all deployments and uh, external inferencing requests are made via this service and the uh, whichever ingress uh, model mesh pod um, it hits, mo uh, model mesh will determine where the model is actually, which actual model server the model is actually deployed in and will route the request as needed. So just a side note, etcd is used as uh, the coordinate operations and you know, persist model and instance states. Yeah, so like I said, the model servers are kind of an integral part of model mesh. So KServe or model mesh has serving runtimes. This is a CRD that is used for defining model serving uh, environments and which container images should be used or loaded and you know, what the supported model formats are. So currently out of the box, these are the two main ones, Triton Inference Server and ML Server. 
Um, and so you can pretty much use anything. I think we're working on, we have OpenVINO and we have, uh, I think, uh, Torch servers in the works. But as long as it supports dynamic loading and unloading, um, Model Mesh should be compatible with it. And so, as mentioned, Model Mesh has been running in production cloud environments for quite a while. So the question that I guess I was thinking about was, is it tenable to bring it you know, on the Kubernetes on the edge? So let's talk about some of the advantage, advantages it might provide. Um, so first, um, through KServe's infant service interface, users are able to easily deploy multiple models um, into singular serving runtime containers or pods, you know, which drastically reduces the resource overhead compared to the single mod, a single model per pod um, um, pattern that we were tr that is typical with traditional model serving. Uh, so each pod typically has, you know, resource requests, and uh, it'll be quite easy to hit allocation limits um, when dealing with even just a few mod models on resource-constrained uh, devices. So another thing we we pay attention, or that Model Mesh is um, one of the key features of Model Mesh is its whole aspect of cache management and and to some extent high availability, right? So. Model Mesh treats the set of pre-provisioned um, pods on, on the Kubernetes cluster as an LRU cache. And so Model Mesh decides which models are loaded or unloaded based on usage recency and, or current request volumes. So you know, if you have multiple edge nodes, a model might be scaled out to have copies on, on each of the nodes if there are um, serving runtimes available. And so if a specific model is Getting, is getting swamped with traffic, it might scale out to, might produce, Model Mesh might decide, hey, let's load this into other of two additional serving runtime pods to kind of create more um, uh, availability for that model. But if a loaded model hasn't received any traffic in a while and a new model comes in and the cache happens to be full, uh, the least recently used model will be evicted from the cache, that means unloaded from the model server's memory um, to make room for the new model to be loaded and used. Yeah, so with this cache management, you know, Model Mesh works well for, you know, handling uh, unevenly distributed uh, inference request load. So, you know, you might have 20 models registered and perhaps only five or are more commonly used. You know, kind of like the 80-20 rule where 20% of the models handle 80% or you know, handling 80% of the traffic. And so some additional uh, highlights of Model Mesh is its, you know, intelligent placement and loading. You know, we try to, Model Mesh tries to balance the cache age across the pods as well as the request to load. So again, it's just striking a balance, trying to keep it balanced. And there is a priority loading of models. So a model with a request waiting for it will be bumped to the front of the line if there is a request waiting on it and if there is a loading queue. So this all ensures we, bal ensures we balance resource usage across nodes or edge devices, as well as improved responsiveness. So after having deployed models, um, what about day two operations? So a key aspect is the operational com uh, simplicity of Model Mesh. You know, it supports rolling updates automatically. So if you deploy a new model, um, the old version of that model, um, will continue to receive all the traffic until the new model is loaded into memory and is ready for inference. And at that point, the traffic will be shifted. So yeah, this all sounds great. So uh, I wanted to try Model Mesh on Edge, and that's, that's what I did. Uh, so here, I, I unfortunately cannot bring my Jetson Nano to this event, but that's a picture of my Jetson Nano on the right. And so on my Jetson Nano, which has a uh, quad core arms, you know, ARM64 based processor and four gigabytes of RAM. I deployed um, MicroShift, which is a small form factor. OpenShift, as I mentioned, um, it, it, it's a it's a project that's currently being developed by the Red Hat Emerging Technologies Group. Um, and for those that don't know what OpenShift is, it's kind of it's a you know the Red Hat's enterprise Kubernetes platform. So in any case, MicroShift does work uh, remarkably well on this, especially on this Jetson Nano. Um, 
it runs as a single binary uh, and runs on less than one gigabyte of RAM and generally less than uh, a core, a single CPU core. So with Microsoft, I have an all-in-one minimal, minimal installation of Kubernetes on my Jetson Nano. And on top of this, I deployed Model Mesh as a, kind of like a standalone installation. So since, yeah, so Model Mesh is a part of the, it's part of KServe, but in this case, I don't care, I didn't really care too much about the uh, single model serving, so I opted to not install the KServe controller and just use the uh, Model Mesh controller, because right now, Model Mesh controller is its own standalone controller. And, you know, this saves, saves resources, right? Trying to squeeze out the most from your uh, device. So with Model Mesh, I was able to deploy a mix of TensorFlow and uh, Onyx machine learning models, which by default with Model Mesh automatically maps to the Triton inference server, uh, serving runtime. And yeah, because yeah, Triton serving, Triton serving runtimes supports quite a few of the model formats. And you know, performing gRPC inference uh, was pretty fast. Uh, Model Mesh, the primary API is gRPC. Um, and so even if, uh, so if a model was loaded in the memory, you get about a second, less than a second inference response time. And then, you know, if it has to unload and load the model, uh, you might, might have to wait a few seconds. And so after that, I wanted to try, you know, higher density model packing. So I wanted to apply, apply more inference services to the cluster to register more models with model mesh. And so I deployed around, um, so in this case, uh, in my scenario, I deployed around 17 or so dense net Onyx models. Um, so these are about, I want to say about 36 megabytes each. Um, they're for image classification over, I think, a thousand or so categories. And so we, on the right, you have a simple diagram where, which kind of shows what's kind of deployed on the model mesh side of things. Um, and so, I expose the service as a node port, and from anywhere on my network, I can um, send inference response or inference requests to Garner to kind of get whatever inference request uh, response uh, for my request. So again, this uses the Kaser V2 protocol, um, gRPC specifically. And so with this, after applying, yes, when I do kubectl get inference services, you know, I was able to get a list of registered models and all of them are listed as ready, even though not all of them are necessarily loaded in memory. So using, so for those familiar with gRPC, usually you have a protobuf that kind of corresponds to the uh, API you're using. So with that, I was able to generate a Python client for which I could send gRPC inference requests with arbitrary images for classification. Um, so in the sample command, I send a, an inference request to one of the deployed Onyx models and receive my inference results based on, uh, this is my cat, uh, Mabel, um, who volunteered or got voluntold to be a part of my image classification. Um, so the response times, even with all of these, all of these models, response time still sub second. Um, but if it is a cache miss, so again, not all of these can be loaded in the memory at once. If it's a cache miss, um, there is a there is a quite a, a few seconds of latency involved because again, model mesh has to unload a model to make room for the target model of inference. So now, of course, even with just this single device, you know, it's an all-in-one cluster um, installed with model mesh. Uh, you know, it was it was very. I was, I was pleasantly surprised to see that I was able to deploy and host uh, quite a few models, more than I expected, actually. And so with multiple devices or um, a separate control plane, right? So my control plane and my worker node are all the same device. Um, but still, I was able to get um, quite a lot out of uh, this installation, especially on such a resource-constrained device. And so. With multiple devices, for instance, if you maybe use a K3S cluster, uh, multi worker node, you could definitely get larger cache sizes for model loading and the opportunity for high availability. You can have multiple rep or copies of models loaded on different nodes. 
and you know, even more compute power, dedicated compute power for the model inference service, uh, servers themselves. So yeah, this is overall uh, a very uh, interesting, to, interesting uh, challenge for me. Um, it was, uh, since I'm a model mesh developer, um, I am looking more into kind of how we can bring model mesh to other kind of areas. And so, uh, you know, generally when you're dealing with, um, I guess, porting things to edge devices, you generally you run into the lack of ARM builds and support. You know, like for instance, KServe has uh, some dependencies on some Python, Python packages which don't necessarily have ARM support. And uh, a lot of container images are only built, you know, you might look for a container image for KServe on Docker Hub right now. That'd just be only um, AMD64 or x86. And so, yeah, and so, Right now, I guess a lot of the images are huge, over a gigabyte, especially. So there's a lot of trimming down that needs to be done. And so that's something that I kind of put into and considered when I was kind of building my own ARM-based images. And of course, when you're dealing with edge devices, the whole need to create um, kind of smaller models and you're doing some techniques like pruning or quantization. That's also, needs, that's also uh, something to be considered. Um, but anyway, if you want to learn more, I do have some links here. Um, definitely um, try out any of these technologies. Um, I do think model mesh, depending on your use case, can be a tenable solution for model serving on edge. Um, and with that, uh, I thank you, and I'll take any questions if there are any.